this says were long. So be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always nice. Oh, there you are. Live. There we go. Right, can you see that? Yes, Is I can. Can I? And there are already four people watching you, darling. And here comes Doris. Hello, Doris. Excellent. Seven watching now. Seven there are people. seven people already. So, thank you. Oh, thank you. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> You're going to set fire to yourself, Doris. Yes, that's not good. Hi, Gretch. What's Hi, going on? Hi. <laughs> so I'm going to do some cutting this evening. 24 now. <laughs> so I They've thought... all been waiting. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's very kind. Yes. Um, I'm going to do some slightly weird cutting this evening. I'll explain in a moment um, what I'm up to because I'm using like the wrong tool and I'm using a block where there's lettering that hasn't been reversed. So it's all the opposite of what I would normally do to get a good print here. <laughs> hi, hello, hi. So, hopefully you can see what I'm using here to cut the wood is actually a lino tool. So this is this is very old. Um, the What's she done? Oh, Doris has just has she cut us off? Yeah. Oh, that's better. Um, <laughs> Hi, Rosanna. So in New Zealand it's sunny. Well, here in Buckinghamshire it's sort of wet fog, so not ideal. Um, but yeah, I'm using this very old lino tool to cut this wood. So what I've got here is a, a bit of poplar um, that we've had for years. It's been in the shed for ages here. And um, I finally got around to using it. But what I'm doing is I'm making a name sign for my stand when we get back to having art fairs. So this is not going to be a print. This is going to be my sign on my, on my stand. Um, oh, hello from Norway and California. Hello, hi. Um, so I just wanted to show you kind of how this poplar was responding to using lino cut tools because I quite often get asked by people about what tool to use for what thing. So <laughs> Doris is eating the bed. I've got my birthday cake here, but Doris is eating the remainder of the birthday cake on the stand at the moment, off camera, thankfully. Um, so I, I often get asked what tool to use and whether a tool is specific to lino or to woodblock. And in the normal course of events, I would not use these lino cut tools for wood. Um, but I am doing this evening because what I'm aiming for is to get a texture building up. I'm going to get Ben to show you. Oh, hi Maria from, from Pennsylvania and who else have we got? Cornwall and North Yorkshire. Fantastic. And Caroline's made it for a live stream. Hi Caroline, well done for making it. So when I do a show, one of the things that's really tricky to get across is what I do in terms of making blocks and making prints. And people often don't realise that you actually have to physically cut the wood and the lino. Um, so 
by having a name sign like this, where I'm actually purposely showing lots of cut marks, it kind of makes the point about what I do. Ooh. <laughs> She's just burnt her nose. <laughs> oh, poor Doris. Has gone out now. Um, she won't be back again now because she's singed herself. I've, maybe I'd better, better blow out the candles for that. So I'm, I'm going to blow out the candles to just make things a bit safer. <laughs> so... Yeah, so this is, um, yeah, this is poplar and it is really, really soft. So you can see my tool is really not meeting any resistance. But this is, these are the normal tools that I would use for woodblock. And these ones are, if I can find one that comes apart, these are really, really nice. They are full of rubbish. So you can see how the blade opens up with those and you can keep sharpening and like moving the blade down as you work um, and these cost I think they cost about sort of 30 pounds a tool something like that so these are a real treat hi Mark oh hi hi Mark yeah I, I look well because I've got lots of makeup on because we're both shattered because we've been really busy today because um, we had a We've got this, this special offer going on our uh, shop at the moment where we're doing a big prize draw. So we've had lots of people shopping today. So we've been running around packing packages and going to the post office and stuff like that. So um, one of the things that I want to talk about tonight are the kind of little prints that I've been making um, for, the, for the shop sale. So I'll talk about that. But to go back, to go back to this and how this is working, um, what I'll do with this is I'll varnish the wood bits and then I probably we originally intended to like roller across the, the written bits, but I won't do that because I'll get way too much ink on the texture. So I'll just pick it out in paint. But the point about it is that it immediately kind of tells people what I do as a printmaker and I think that's something that it's quite hard sometimes to get across to an audience I don't know if anybody else sort of feels that as printmakers that it's sometimes quite hard to show people how you do things and one of my favorite questions that I get quite often is where do I buy my designs because people think that I buy like stamps and do stamping um, which I always quite find quite funny. Um, oh, right, yes, it's... Um, yeah, it's, yeah, that's right, there's sort of somebody mentioning cutting, lino cutting at school as well. That's, that's the other thing, is that people sort of, in the UK, I don't know if it's the same for you guys abroad, but there's kind of, if you say, you, if I say that I do woodblock printing and particularly Japanese woodblock printing, that's always seen as like a mysterious art that must be amazingly complicated. And if I say I do lino cut, then people are like, oh, I did that in primary school. That's like nothing, it's really easy. So it, it, it's interesting to know that if I cut a sign like this in wood for my stand at the art fair then that means more to people in terms of value than if I cut a sign in lino for the same fair and that's always seemed like a real shame to me because I think that lino has so much potential and yet it's not seen as a ter terrifically kind of... Um, oh yeah, Bridget has just said she gets asked for the original. Yeah, that's another big problem I have with with people who they, they sort of, I love your work, but where is the original? That is quite a... a In your head, thing. isn't it, love? <laughs> yeah, to, but it's, it's, it's hard when you talk about kind of the way you make your work and somehow that's seen as less authentic than doing a painting um, in some ways. I had a, a student once who told me that she had 
gone off and learnt lino cut and when she came to, to show with her art group she wasn't allowed to hang her lino cuts on the wall she had to put them in a cupboard with the pottery because it was seen as a craft and not as an art form um, which is is a real shame but you know I mean a lot of people do get it but an awful lot don't and that that makes it very difficult I think that's very discouraging for people um, Oh yeah, potato stamping is, yeah, I get, I do get that as well. And the irony of it is that Japanese woodblock is kind of trickier in some ways, but it's no more complex than lino cut. Um, Ginger oh, has just had cake in honour of your birthday. Thank you. Well, I have a cake here, uh, which we bought, which already has dirt on it. <laughs> It's not printing it, I think it's soot. Um, which we bought it in the supermarket. I have to say that Mr B has not made me cake. He did make me dinner, but he hasn't made me a cake. So we've got this rather odd sort of little cake here, which I expect we'll eat anyway, but it's it's more for effect. But we do have some, we do have some fits. Yeah, cheers. we do have. Yes. yes. Cheers. Um, so yes, Yasmin, says that yeah as a problem with explaining hand pull prints versus commercial sort of inkjet printing and that's another thing that is a real problem about explaining um the difference between i don't know if you guys in america have the gicle printing but quite often painters will be selling what they refer to as limited edition gicle printing and um, yeah, I've got no gripe with them doing that, but it's very hard when you are producing something that's an original print and people can't understand the difference between it. It's quite a, a difficult. Yeah, Rosanna is, is re saying be careful with the tools and the fizz. I think it's a bit late for that. I've already had <laughs> quite a lot of it. <laughs> Um, I'm Angie likes the... my handwriting. Oh, good. Yeah, that is Ben's handwriting. I'm going to move the cake out the way. Um, yes, that's 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 Ben's writing. My writing is is not legible enough. So, I got Ben to write this on a piece of paper, and then he blew it up to sort of full size for me to use that. And. Speaking of tools, the other thing that I wanted to show you um, were rollers. We were talking about rollers. The last live stream that we did, um, I was talking about the rollers that I use and the importance of a really soft roller like these, these Durathene ones. And I just wanted to show you how sticky they are as well. So, I mean, there's a piece of perspex here that I would normally roll out. Um, ink on and you can see if I see I can't even see how sticky that roller is and that makes it really really excellent for inking up um, oh right so oh yeah Cheryl talks about <laughs> I think my days of 21 are long gone. <laughs> um, yeah, Cheryl's saying she's she's seen quite a few people selling gicle rather than numbered prints in the US. That is a really difficult situation. I've been, um, not recently, but a while ago, I used to do a lot of kind of craft fairs where there would be all sorts of people selling all sorts of things. And I had a day where the organiser thought she'd be really helpful and she put me next to another printmaker. And the other printmaker was selling, well, they weren't even gicle prints, they were basically inkjet prints of her work. And they were going for like five or ten pounds. And I was asking at the time, I think about 80 pounds, 90 pounds for my work. And it was a disaster because nobody could really sort of understand the difference in price and it was very difficult because I didn't want to kind of bad mouth her but I couldn't really sort of say well you know I was saying well these are like the real thing and those have come off a computer and it's it's just a very difficult situation 
Fortunately, these days, uh, most of the fairs and things that I go to, they're really strict about that sort of stuff and you're not allowed to sell giclés. But that's kind of why I'm, I'm also, why I'm cutting a sign um, because I want to sort of show that it is authentic and it is kind of the real, the real deal. And that's, that's always kind of a problem, I think, for printmakers somehow. Um, so Mark is, Mark, my brother is being, says that the French gicle means to spurt or squirt, which is really good because of course it's, it's like inkjet printing, sort of high quality inkjet printing. So that's a bit of a, a problem. But the reason I was showing you this squishy roller is I wanted to just show you these two prints. They're in plastic because we like bag them up to send them to people. But I've been working on these, these um, prints for the pledge. And what I wanted with these was to get a very particular kind of feel about them. And these are printed in oil-based ink and they're printed on the paper that I always use for lino, which is Fabriano Rosa Spina, so quite a heavy paper. But I wanted them to have um, quite an old fashioned feel and quite a, a sort of uh, almost woodblock kind of feel to them. I'm going to get Ben to hold them up to the camera. That's the wrong oh, way up. That's the wrong way up, yeah. No, Ben's, been, dri Ben's up. been drinking too. Oh, that's better. Yeah. So, what I did to achieve that kind of texture is to use a really, really good roller and then very little ink. So there's virtually no ink going down onto the um, paper there. And that gives that kind of very textured and slightly starved feel to it, which makes it look almost more like a woodblock print, um, which was kind of the effect I was looking for with those ones. So having a, a really excellent roller means that you can get a really cohesive layer of ink if you want it but you can also manipulate it to get virtually no ink in a kind of very even way I mean yeah, hopefully you can see there with with Betty's fur it's kind of an appealing texture but still giving an even kind of coverage um, Oh, the Unica. I have, uh, Roseanne wants to know if I've used tried Fabriano Unica. I have. Um, I haven't used it very much myself in the studio, but it's, I mean, I hear good things about it. I think it's a very good doer because it's got like uh, one side is quite textured and the other side is quite smooth. What I would say is that the, I'm not sure if it comes in variable weights now. When I was given some to try, um, a couple of years ago it came in quite a heavy weight and that made it quite hard to hand print with when I tried hand printing with it just using the back of a spoon it was very textural but on the press I think it would be very good but I think that that the point of Unica is it's a kind of affordable universal printing paper so you can use it for etching and dry point and, and relief print and stuff like that um, so, you know, it's, I think it's quite a nice paper, quite an interesting paper to experiment with. Um, right. Oh, Artwork says that the, she's ordered the ladies, the cats, today. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the other thing I should say about this print is that I did use quite a lot of uh, masking off using mylar. So I had some mylar and I cut myself little flaps because the toes and Betty's eye, which is a sort of bright gold colour, they were actually cut into a block um, 
where I was, I had to ink them in a different colour. This, the toes were a separate colour on this block and the yellow was actually on the same block as Doris's sort of brownie fur. So I was sort of stenciling off areas when I was working on these and I printed a lot of them. So it was important to have a really easy way of blocking off areas of the print and using like mylar with, with a couple of hinges and masking tape so you can flap it open, ink it up and then flap it down and print is a, it's a really good method and it doesn't emboss the paper in any way either. Um, so yeah, Simsy, hi from Australia. Hello. Hi. Um, you have to say good day. Good day. Yes, <laughs> I don't have to say that's all. Sorry, I don't, that's terrible. Um, good evening. Good evening. Yes. Good evening from the UK. So the other print that I did at the same time as these is this little one, and this one is slightly, <laughs> um, slightly different. Um, and the reason I wanted to show you this one is that it's actually three layers and it's showing, you can see that kind of rainbow roll of colours across the, the layers there, um, which give it kind of interest and texture. So that one um, dates back to earlier. And of course the, the hard part of doing a print like this is actually keeping the areas clean around it. And um, that again, I what I did with that is when I've cut the, the, the block when I started, obviously was a sort of uh, the whole piece of lino was was an oblong, and then I cut out the the areas I wanted to print, but then I took a Stanley knife, um, a box cutter, and just chopped off the lino kind of in rough angles and prized it off the backing board so that there was nothing there. So when I ink up, I don't get any transfer because when you use white space like I do in a lot of prints, it's really difficult keeping those areas <laughs> clean. Um, a query about Angie Hatchett asks about uh, Mylar and... Oh, no. Um, yeah, so Angie wants to know if I've gone over to Mylar for offset instead of polydraw. So the Mylar, yeah, that works really well with that offsetting, you know, taking a... Um, inking up a block and then printing onto the Mylar and then putting in a fresh block and rubbing the wet ink off the mylar onto the fresh block. That works really well with mylar. Polydraw doesn't work at all, but I would still stick to polydraw for doing tracings because polydraw actually behaves exactly like tracing paper when you use it to actually make a Because a you used to use um, tracing paper, not polydraw for I did use offsets, to use tracing you? paper. So here is, here is some of that mylar. Uh, sorry, no, this is polydraw. So you can see with this polydraw uh, tracing film, you can take tracing with pencil. And I've actually used, um, done a rubbing with some carbon paper here to check my alignment for my print. Um, so you can see the red and the blue is actually carbon paper that I've rubbed onto it to show where I'm, I'm printing. So I wouldn't give up on using poly drawers tracing paper, but it's rubbish for transfer. Denise wants to, uh, sorry, Ben Carlo wants to know, well, well, I think wants to be introduced to your press. To my press. Oh, right. Okay. Um, do you want to do a bit of track? We'll do a bit of sick making tracking so that you can see. I could I'm actually doing. bring it over. You yeah. could, well, yes, yeah, so you can bring it over. So we'll introduce you to the printing press. So. Um, Bear with us while we just get the camera in the right place. Okay, so... Our cable's not long enough. <laughs> so this is an Albion press, um, and this is made by, um, as you can see, it's Hops Hopkinson and Cope, who are the inventors of the Albion press. Um, so 1876. So this press 
is actually younger. I used to have an 1851 press, which was smaller. And then I bought this press. Um, let me just move that out of the way. And this press is quite interesting because it's not a standard size. Printing presses like this usually came in paper sizes. So the, pay, the press I had before was a broadsheet press, which was effectively a newspaper press. So it would have been printing broadsheet newspapers like The Times, things like that. But this one actually doesn't have a standard bed to it. Um, this isn't a standard size. And the reason for that was because they were commissioned quite often for the client. And because they came sort of with these two legs to support them, it doesn't really matter how long the bed is or indeed how wide it is if it fits in between the supports. Do you want to roll it in? Huh? So, there we go. So we think this one was probably used for posters and things like that. You can see it's had kind of a long life. It's had bits replaced. Um, we've had the strapping replaced and we've put a new stop on the end. In fact, the wooden pulley block needs replacing yeah, even Ben's now. Yeah, Ben's going to make a new block for a, a pulley block for inside it. Um, it's actually in, in pretty good condition, but you can see, I show you the bed here because Ben has made this for me um, and it's based on the registration device that I use to hand print with and, and, and my students use um, and it's just a block of MDF so the MDF takes the lino up to type height and then I've got I just put in a piece of three mil MDF with the lino on it and then it's at the right height for me to print with but what I do do is to have um, this this is my packing this is how I control the pressure so you can see I've got lots of sheets of card here and that's quite a firm stiff white card and I vary the pressure a lot with my printing so that can vary between it packed so tight that I can barely take an impression you know it's a real effort to pull the bar across right down to maybe one layer of card where I'm just tapping the weight down and sometimes I won't even use the press I'll just get use the press to line everything up and then I'll hand rub if it's something really really delicate so um, I use the the card a lot to control the, the pressure of it um, so that's that's basically um, my printing press it's got nice feet as well do you want to show them the feet I like the feet of them And I do have two presses. I'll get Ben to turn around so you can see the little one. The little one is um, not in quite as good nick. This is, this is not as fancy as the other one. This isn't a Hopkinson and Cope one. This is, um, I think they sold the patent and this is like a much, they're much less proud of this. This is a real worker day printing press and it's actually got a big dent in it there um, you know we we had we were this is how I started my career this was given to us by um, family friends on a kind of lifetime loan and I was I was working in the photographic industry for years I hadn't even done any drawing let alone any printmaking and they said did I want this and for a whole year, I said, no, I didn't want it, which is really, really stupid. But anyway, I ended up having it and it does work really well. Again, Ben has made uh, a registration system for the bed of it for me, but it's had a few dings and knocks. So it's got a dent out of it there. 
and um, it's had to have a few things replaced. And that's if you buy a press, if you want to buy yourself a printing press, I would be really careful about buying anything in pieces. Um, quite often I've seen on eBay, you get like parts of these and people are selling them as complete presses. So it's, it, it's a good idea to, to not do that, to always see the, the press assembled and preferably to try it. I mean, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but here in the UK, it's a small world. And when I've bought presses, they're, they're sort of known to other printmakers and I've been able to ask about them. Um, the big press was actually owned by the people who used to organise a big arts festival called Art in Action in Oxfordshire that I used to do every year. So I knew that press really well before I owned it because once a year I would see it in action in a marquee in a field in Oxfordshire. So it kind of um, wasn't difficult for me to buy it because I knew it already worked well. But they are mighty investments, um, so it sort of pays to get it right. Um, I'm going to go back to my desk and sit down. <laughs> Probably everyone's feeling a bit sick. Yeah, I was just checking to see if there are any questions. Oh, Denise wants to know um, if I have any embossing happen with heavier paper when I'm printing. Um, I do sometimes get a slight embossing with the Fabriano Rosaspina when I'm, I'm printing, especially if I do a print where there's a lot of white space and then very fine lines. And that's kind of almost inevitable. But the way that I, I handle that is that I never, I try never to ink fine detail until the last possible moment. So I did a film recently about, um, where is it? Let me just find it. I was going to show you these little prints. Yeah. I did a film recently about this, this print here and those little tiny birds. Um, there, you can see they are um, slightly embossing the paper, or maybe you can't see, but they are slightly embossing the paper. But I was very careful about how I printed those at the last possible moment. Um, I, can't, I don't think we can right. see that really. So, I don't think we can show it, yeah, maybe not. So to go back to the presses, I've got a, a couple of questions here. Uh, a domestic alternative to a large heavy press. Um, there are some great sort of historical alternatives. There's um, Edward Borden, who used to do like massive lino cuts. He used to make his children sort of do lots of stomping across them. Um, if you talk to Edward Borden's son, he has unhappy memories of being made to like rub the back of prints and things like that. So yeah, children, um, good slave labour, I think. I, I don't know that, I mean, I, I know a couple of people who are, have really odd presses made by their engineer husbands. I know someone who's got a kind of thing made out of bits of old cars and hydraulics. And I also know a really sad story about a lady who had a linen press. And this was an old linen press. I think it was French originally, and she used it for her printmaking and she really loved it. And it had like a screw and it was a wooden cupboard with a sort of screw in it. And she used to use that to print. And she had to go away for a few months and her husband and she left her mother-in-law house sitting. And when she came back, her mother-in-law had very kindly done it up for her into a shishi piece of furniture and had absolutely ruined it. <laughs> so that was really, really unfortunate. Um, but I don't know that there's a sort of effective way of getting that weight because those presses will put so much pressure on. Um, and Matthew's, Matthew's asking, asking about asking evenness about of pressure. Even pressure. They do. They put, 
technically because it's a flat bed and when you pull the handle across it it drops the whole bed onto the press. Assuming that it's been set up right. Assuming it's set up. So first of all you need to have the press installed and it's a bit like installing a billiard table. You have to get it completely level. Under this press um, there is a bed of concrete and when we built the studio because Ben built the studio and um, the way it goes is he designs it and he builds it and he does all the clever stuff and I just heave things about so I was like his assistant and if anybody ever demolishes this shed it's going to look horribly like we've tried to get rid of a body because there's like a coffin of concrete under that press there because it needs the support so you have to get it completely level and then it's adjusted so that the weight is putting an even pressure down but that doesn't mean that it will give you an even pressure because if you have a block um, I haven't got a good example I'm going to send Ben off to see if we can find a good example if you have a block where most of it is cut away and you've got a little bit like if you look at this block here if you imagine that just this little bit here was left and it's all right don't worry love I've got one here um this bit wasn't here the bed will actually tilt down because there's nothing to support it oh here's a good example thank you yeah a really good example so this this is the um table for the print of Doris so that's the blue table area and when I was printing it it was not it wouldn't give me an even pressure because the the weight will tilt down and you get an uneven pressure so the trick is to put a little strip of lino at the top of the block outside the picture and that just gives the, the weight something to balance on so I but don't use it on soft paper or to yeah, emboss. Yeah, you have to watch it embossing. So I quite often will leave lino on the print longer than I need it, which is why in this print here I've left this this sky block up here, even though I was printing just this bit of it. So if I show you. Um, so the last thing to get printed were those little trees at the bottom. Uh, Terry's asking about using a large brayer oh, well, roller for, for, to, to, to print. But yeah, I, 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 it would yeah, have to be a hard a one. It would it? have to be a hard roller. I mean, um, yeah, so you can see to get that little print there, I left the lino so that the weight was even for the printing. Um, if you are going down the hand printing route, certainly you can get really good results simply by rubbing the back with a baron or uh, a spoon or something like that. If you look at um, Ian Phillips's work, if you look up, I think he his website is reliefprint.co.uk, his early work uh, landscapes of Wales they're all hand printed and they are remarkable and they're actually in real life are quite big prints um, I, I have made a film about work by friends on our walls the art on our walls which hasn't come out yet but that's got one of Ian's hand printed prints in it and he did get amazing effects simply by rubbing the back of the print with a bamboo baron and um, a spoon I think he used so it's perfectly possible to do that um, okay uh, hi Glynis um, the, the tortilla press yeah I've never <laughs> I've never done that. Um, Tortillas aren't so big in England, are they? Yeah, it does it's, it's, it's be something But it sounds like, that. like a But it does a sound good like idea. a good, And a lot of people use the kind of bookbinding presses, the kind of pinch presses they're called, with the big screw on top. Um, personally, I'm, I'm not very patient, so I'm not sure that I could handle that. Um, but certainly... Uh, Somebody is asking me, yeah, Sylvia is asking me about maintaining bamboo barons. So let me show you um, what I've got for that. 
So what I do with the Baron is that I have made myself these like little cotton pads. So you could make them out of felt or out of cotton. And the idea is that the Baron then has a nice soft place to sit while you're working. And um, I put a few drops of camellia oil onto it. Now, um, camellia oil, you can get as a printmaking supply, but it's also a carrier oil for aromatherapy. So you can, you can kind of get it for that as well. And it's literally just a couple of drops. And periodically, it's just rubbing the bamboo with camellia oil, or you can rub it on your face for your, the, the oil on your skin. But when you use it, every so often, you just want to, if we can, I can show you, move it round. So it, um, Ben will demonstrate for you. You're, the idea is that you're trying to get a nice even wear across it. Um, yeah. And just look after it like that. And it's, it's really just a matter of remembering to put it on something nice and soft. I always forget and it's like half off some, on a hard edge which isn't ideal. What you'll find eventually is that you'll start to wear through it. And there are some good tutorials online about how to recover a baron. It's, it's, it's tricky, but it's not as bad as it looks. What you need to do is to practice. And I don't know if there's anyone in the UK selling the bamboo skins, uh, the bamboo leaves to do it. Um, but if you can get hold of them, then recovering a baron is perfectly doable. I mean, I've done it and you know, it's, it's uh, a good way of prolonging the life of it. Um, yeah, Matthew is saying to go back to presses. Uh, yeah, Terry, you could, there. yeah, I mean, a book press it. 18 by 24, 18 that's by a 24. big press. That is a big boy press. And they're starting to get quite expensive to buy as well. We were, um, saw one for sale the other day that was that was a huge amount of money um that was a new one though yeah so i'm just looking at the book yeah the book press so matthew's problem is it doesn't give the same pressure as the edges as the middle so it's it is really tricky because in an ideal world there would be a lovely affordable alternative to having to have a massive cast iron uh, printing press for lino but I, I have don't seen think there is. a really efficient press made out of MDF and using a car jack um, Helen had one. Oh right yes. My dad made it. And is there not a do a big make a press I think a big make a press that's on like two bits of wood on a metal frame and they, you can clamp it it down. There, there are a number on the market. What it won't do for you, which is is a real shame, or it's not as easy, is this this sort of dancing with the pressure where you can you can change the pressure a lot. Because a lot of what I do really relies on that. I mean doing um fine work, so I've got that's a block that uh, I left the ink on for you to see. That's that's very fine work block there. Um, yeah, so that really needs very, very little pressure to get a clean print. So really little ink and really just a tap of um pressure down and that that although it looks quite transparent gray there's no extender in that if you're printing something as fine as this printing with extender in the ink is really difficult because it gets quite sticky so when i get down to this sort of thing i rely more on rolling out a really really thin layer of ink and very little pressure to get this clean effect 
um, without any kind of gloopiness to it because what you don't want is that kind of double edge that you get when the ink's a bit gloopy and it's almost like it squelches down so um, that's an instance where I would have taken out nearly all of the card and just let the press tap down um, so yeah shared shared workspaces yeah there are there are some really really excellent um shared spaces there's uh one i know of east london is it east london printmakers yeah yeah they've got i i went to visit uh one jin ho who is a wonderful printmaker at east london printmakers and it's the most magnificent setup it's really really impressive um, but we have a couple locally as well, and Oxford Printmakers are another group um, who I think have very good facilities. So they do exist where you can use a press, but if you share a press, then there's always that business of kind of the registration and how it's fixed and then, you know, keeping it adjusted right and stuff like but that. But you can use one of my rich devices. But you can use one of Mr. <laughs> rich devices. Um, yeah. Uh, and as, as Sinead yes. says, you can use an etching press. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, etching presses, which so tend again, to be easier... It's harder to, to, to fine-tune fine the pressure with an etching press. Yeah, it is. Um, but not, I mean, it doesn't, not everybody wants to print like I do. And if you, if you want just a nice, uh, you want to get a nice cohesive layer every time that's like the same every time, then it's easier to sort of set up. Um, but yes, that, that's, that's possible. Um, so the extender that I use, yeah, I use a traditional extender. Let me grab it. So there's a couple of things that I use with it. So this is the stuff I use, which is Cranfields. There are, I think, other makes available. Um, but that's the one that I use. And there is this stuff here. Uh, called tack reducer or wiping compound um, and that just stops the stringiness of it you need to use virtually none of this I mean tiny tiny bit and it's it's effectively like uh, well Cranfield who make a version of this refer to it like Vaseline it's it's a sort of like petroleum jelly almost and a little tiny bit of that in the extender will loosen it up a bit and stop that kind of pizza cheese effect um, yeah I mean Glynis is, is talking about uh, the Frome etching press uh, which is reasonably pressed I don't know that one Glynis um, but that sounds that sounds pretty good. I quite fancy having an etching press because I quite fancy doing some intaglio with lino. So that's kind of something that I'm thinking about. Um, the other thing is, of course, the wax dryer, which allows everything to dry quickly. So I use that at about four percent. And that works well with extender and ordinary ink just to speed up the drying time. So when I was doing these ones, I don't know if you can hear, but Doris has come back. She's got over burning her nose on the birthday cake. These ones um, were dry within 24 hours. So there's um, one, two, three, four layers on those. And... That black was dry within 24 hours using 4% dryer. The other thing that I learned from Cranfield, um, which has been really, really helpful, and probably everybody knew this except me, was that if you have prints drying up, hanging up to dry, and you, before you leave them for the night, make sure the air is moving. So a fan, or if you've got a heater on the lower setting, anything that will keep the air in motion, then they dry so much quicker. 
um, than if the air is just hanging still about them. It's not um, the warmth, it's the movement of the air is really important, um, which I didn't know. But now what I do is I have a, a sort of electric radiator thing and I set it on the lowest setting. So it's not actually making any heat, but it does do enough to make the air move. And that's been a huge, um, huge improvement. Uh, oh, we're talking about extenders for water based. Yeah, you can um, get extender for water based. The one that I particularly like is made by Graphic Chemical, who are an American company. Quite tricky to get over here. Lawrence Art Supplies do it, but it's a bit kind of when it's in stock. But that's a really good water based extender. Um, Right, so Roseanne's off to the garden. Yep, have a good one, Roseanne. Um, and, oh, hi from Vancouver. Yeah, Intaglio with Lino is really interesting. Um, I just like the idea of being able to have one piece of Lino and you create a reduction print but also have intaglio off that. Um, if you look up uh, Wan Jin Ho's work, she quite often works like that. She uses soft cut lino. Um, I will get Ben. Do you want to? We, we need to put her details up. Um, and and she works in taglio, so she she'll actually do the outlines of her lino cuts in intaglio and then she'll switch to relief and that's something that I'm quite interested in and I'm also interested in having a look at uh, Moku Lito, Lito which is wood lithography it's a Japanese technique which is um, doing lithography on wood which I know almost nothing about but I'm quite entertained to try and that you need to mention because Wan Jin Ho that's that's the lady to look at she's her work's really really interesting um, I can't look her up on the internet because then you, yeah. we both lose yeah our we would lose you if we did that screen. so um yeah she is she is a very interesting printmaker um so the other thing that I was going to talk about actually was Using, yeah. There's a question from oh. Cheryl B about uh, Duralol replacement for acetate. We just need to say that we haven't done that. Oh, yeah, no, I don't know that. I've never tried it. What I, I would really suggest playing with stuff because it's interesting what works and what doesn't. When you're, is, this is for offsetting your key block onto different blocks for lino. And I always used to use tracing paper because I figured that that kind of didn't absorb the liquid very fast. So you, you get your print onto the tracing paper and then with the wet ink on the tracing paper, you mark up your new block. But I wonder if Duralar is just a, an alternative version of Mylar. Oh, possibly. It might be just might a different well trade name. But actually changing yeah. over from using a paper to using a plastic was really effective. And the thing about it is that the method that I use, it doesn't give you crystal clear detail. It gives me enough that I can line up something like this, but it won't give you like the high sensitivity detail that, that people achieve when they do and they scan their work and they do a printout of their work and then they use acetone or something on the the back of the paper to lift the ink onto the lino but the way that I do it it positions everything as well as transferring the image because of course everything's locked in and registered at the moment of transferring the image from the key block onto the other block so it does put everything in the right position and the other thing about it is that you can kind of do it with minimal effort. You don't have to scan the image and print it out or anything like that. So it does have advantages. It's a little bit clumsier, but then, you know, any overlaps and stuff I can refine as I print. 
a couple more questions there. What? Um, apparently Duralar is much stiffer, so I can't, I'm can't. not quite sure how that would oh, right. so I'm not work sure. for you. Yeah, I'm dying to learn things. more, more yeah. about Mocha Lita. Um, I was going to go and do a class just before COVID and then I couldn't because of COVID, so I've never got around to trying it. But I, if I do try it, I promise I will tell everyone about it. Um, uh, the difference between Cranford Safe Wash tack Oil reducer. and Tack Reducer. So the Safe Wash Oil, do you mean the Safe Wash Oil based inks? Because they do produce um, an extender. Let me show you. Yeah. So this is the safe wash extender. Um, that they make and the safe wash, the difference between safe wash and oil-based ink, partially, I mean, the big difference is the cleaning. These, these things you can wash off with a wet cloth. Uh, oil-based, you need white spirit. But the, the difference is in the texture as well. Um, the, the safe wash inks are much softer and they are all the same texture because the linseed oil that goes into the safe wash is formulated to be washable with water. So um, I don't know what magic they do to it, but they do some magic that makes it um, washable with water. Whereas traditional oil-based inks that I use, the when they make them at Cranfield, they use whatever viscosity of linseed oil suits the pigment that they're using. So they might use a different viscosity of linseed oil for an earth pigment um, as opposed to, say, a, a synthetic pigment. So they are stiffer and I find the oil-based ones easier to control. I find, for me, I mean, it's just me personally, um, I, I find these, these harder to work with because I like a really, really thin layer of ink and these are a bit soft for that. Um, I don't feel I can control them as easily as the stiffer traditional inks. Um, all right, okay, so Angie, it's not the extender, it's, uh, it's used to dilate the scythe washing ink. Ooh, yeah, no, I don't know. I've not used that. Um, I know, I just sort of, because I don't tend to use these. I do know there is an oil. I would think you'd have to be really careful with that. Um, but I don't know. I don't Because you don't want it to be softer. You want it to be harder. I don't want it to be softer. I want it to go harder. What I would say is that the other advice that Cranfield gave me, which was really good, was to spend a lot longer rolling out your inks before you start printing than you think you need. Because the more you work the ink, the better and the more responsive it becomes. Um, certainly with the traditional inks and the colder the weather, the longer I roll them out for and the longer I roll them out for, the better they behave. So it's um, what... Michael Crane, who's the um, managing director at Cranfield, what he was saying is that he quite often sees when he goes to talk to students that they they add in tack reducer or they add in oil or whatever to the ink to soften it up on a cold morning, which is like what you would think. Um, and that's great. But as soon as the studio starts to warm up, those inks become very loose and they don't respond as well. Whereas if they just spent time rolling out and warming them up, they would work better. Um, let's have a look. Good George says that the oil helps you get an even coverage. Oh, right, that's interesting. That's, so similar to the tack reducer. Um, that's what you use yeah. a really expensive roller for, isn't it? <laughs> that's why, yeah, that's why I'm using an expensive roller. Um, so the Cranfield make, Printmaker's Wax Dryer, it does work on Safe Wash, yes. It certainly does. 
Um, right. Uh, so, I think this is light fast as traditional inks? Yes, the pigments are the same as far as I know with Cranfields. Um, they, they are exactly the same pigment and um, Cranfields certainly work to like high professional standards so I don't think there's any difference in light fastness between them as far as I know but what I would say about Cranfield is that they really like questions um, when we went to interview them for the podcast that I do the Ask an Artist podcast that I do they were like tell people to ask us because we really like answering questions so you know if you've got any questions that you want to ask them there's a, a really lovely technical director there a guy called Paul and he's he's like there is <laughs> he's nothing love he, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's gonna love you but he's really knowledgeable and and they're brilliant at answering questions and Ben is um, asking about Caligo um in relation to how, yeah. how much open time you get with them. You get a lot of open time with them. I don't think I have ever had them dry on me while I've been working. You know, with water-based inks, you get them and they, they can quite quickly start to become but, tacky. But the fact is that you still prefer oil-based, given the choice. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the uh, safe wash, they're still, they are oil-based, so you get that long, open uh openness with them and they i mean they are they you know for a lot of things they're really good and i i use them when i demonstrate and it, you know if i'm doing lino printing in the middle of a field then these are brilliant because you can have like a bucket of water and a flannel and clear up and it's no problem um it's just that i'm i prefer when i'm working in the studio to use white spirit and traditional oil basting but yeah, no, it's it's uh, certainly Cranfield are, they have on their website, they have a, a form you can fill in to ask questions. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, okay. So, I'm just reading through the questions here to see if there's any. There's a repeat box with printed layers. Okay. Sorry, Cheryl, I, th I think that's, uh, that she's asking there. Patsy something. Oh, right, okay, so that's not a question for me. Um, yeah, I was, what else was I going to say? Yeah, I mean... You're uh, going to talk about Oh, these. I was going to talk about these, yeah. You'd better do that reasonably Really quickly. quickly. So I just, I kind of wanted to just sort of say about how interesting it was to work with painting directly onto the lino. So for these grey ones that I've been making the YouTube videos about, I didn't do any preparatory drawings like I usually do, and I didn't do any reversing of the image. And all I did was to get some white poster paint and some black ink. And then I just painted myself pictures directly onto the lino. So it was kind of interesting to just abandon any planning and go with the flow and adapt to it so that's how calm you know that that one there is probably the most like a painting but they're all done like that and that's why the foregrounds are quite painterly as well so i was kind of just going with what i painted but there was no color in the painting so i was able to kind of just create color as i wanted to <laughs> I love Rona's comment here. Paul at Cranfield said to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be his least favourite person now. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how different they've come out when they all came out of the same grey, rather miserable grey paintings. They've come out looking really different and also really interesting to work on grey paper. Because I had never really thought about it before, but I use the white paper like watercolour people use white to shine through the inks. And of course you can't do that here because it's, it's, it's very grey. Um, ben is having much more of a conversation because my screen has frozen so I can't see um, what's going on. I, it's frozen with a really unflattering picture of me with my eyes shut as well, which is a bit off-putting. 
So. That's, that's like the last one I wanted to show you. That was the other thing that I wanted to say about working on the grey paper was, of course, the white ink, that's three layers of white ink to get it to look that white. So I was sort of playing with how many times that I painted, I printed the white to build up to the white layers. Right, no, oh, oh, oh. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. Uh, okay. What's, oh, right, you want to show, is it the, this one you want to see up close, maybe the sunset one? one. Sunset one, is that the one? I'll show you the foreground. It's the foreground. Well, the foreground is probably the most interesting. Um, good. Shall we go through them one by one quickly? Oh, yeah, he, yeah. Well, Ben will go through them. But thank you, everybody, for coming along tonight. Um, Yeah, I'm going to eat my cake now, the very, the small artificial cake. Um, the bit of it that Doris hasn't eaten. I think I've seen this should, one I before, think you, I think. Yeah. Huh? I think you should show them Doris. She's, Doris, Doris has gone to bed, so we'll show you her as well. Before we go, turn the camera around to see but thank you for watching um, oh and I'll drink yeah here we go yeah. Yeah. say hello to the camera <laughs> she's not impressed <laughs> right yeah. Cheers, everybody. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll enjoy the rest of the wine and the horrible little artificial birthday cake and catch you again soon. Bye. <laughs> We're still on.